Tamam. Ama seninki de şer oldu. Wait, wait, be soft shit. Kimseki de şer. Ben de sakın. So, uh, hello everyone. I think you're live. Yes. Uh, good. Amazing. So, uh, today we have Lauren just come with us to, um, to tell us about Oa Um And uh, it's one of the biggest events in history, in the history of our community. More than 400 people registered. Um, we will be watching um, the live chat on YouTube, um, and um, uh, Lorenzo is also watching there. So, in case you have some questions to ask, uh, ask there. And one second, and um, I got the weapon, and um, he, will, he will try to answer uh, when he has a bit of peace of mind and uh, 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 bundles some questions together. What else do I have to tell you? Uh, Lorenzo, uh, welcome. I understood you had some prizes for us, right? Some raffle. Uh, sure. So we have um, a lot of books today. We actually have um, three paper copies of Spring Security in Action I have prepared for you. And I'm ready to deliver them in um, any location in Romania and another six uh, e-vouchers for three Spring Security in Action and three Spring Quickly. So uh, we will have a Kahoot uh, qu um, a quiz at the end of uh, the session. Uh, and uh, three of uh, the prizes will go uh, to the participants, to, to the top three participants of the Kahoot. And then uh, the other six will be um, raffled by Victor. Right, cool. So I will share with you one second, forms, the link that you should fill in. I will repeat the link at the end with the um, form, the Google form for the random raffle. But also pay attention because there are also prizes uh, going on. The, the link is uh, on YouTube right now. It's pasted. It's the Google uh, form for that. I don't want to waste more time. Um, Lorenzo, welcome. I will let yourself introduce. I would just want to say that I know Lorenzo for a long, for many, many, many years already. And I'm very, very honored to have you here. Thank you very much for inviting me, Victor. <laughs> Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank <laughs> no, you so much. Here. So let me share you my screen first. Um, and I hope you you can see my presentation now because we'll, we'll do some um, uh, presentation uh, on the slides, but we'll also have some code. Um, if uh, there is something, just write me in the chat and I would like to take also the uh, all, all your questions. Um, and also at the end, um, any discussion after this um, hour of presentation, if you would like to stay with me, we can continue the discussion. Um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, I will try again, uh, as I said, to answer to all your, all your questions. Um, again, thank you very much for, invite, for inviting me, Victor. Um, I will start the presentation uh, with, uh, uh, I think you're not seeing the correct, Part. Okay, here. Let me let me show the slides like this. So I will I will actually actually start by uh, of course letting you know that you can find me also on my YouTube channel. Um, I have a recently started a blog, and you can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn LinkedIn uh, to discuss other topics uh, as well. Uh, and uh, in what concerns this presentation, we will start with uh, an intro to OAuth two. And you'll find out during the presentation that we have um, two main things we want to discuss. First of all is how um, a, the client application gathers a token. And you'll see a token is very important because it is basically used to get authorized against the backend application. Uh, and then of course, the second uh, important uh, subject is how uh, the validation, how, how the backend validates the token. Uh, and then we will also uh, see that on a demo application, on a very simple demo application, uh, I have implemented pre prior to this um, um, uh, to this presentation, uh, which is a notarization server implementing implemented with the new uh, solution that is now in development by the Spring Security team. Um, so yeah, let's get started again. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I'm impressed to see this big number of uh, people attending this presentation and I hope you like the presentation and you'll enjoy also the prizes uh, at uh, the end of the presentation. Uh, I invite you to leave questions again and I will try to answer to them um, in, 
um, as, as fast as, I, as it's possible. Um, in order not to interrupt also uh, when I uh, when I present the things so it doesn't get uh, bother. So what OAuth 2 is? OAuth 2 is first of all an authorization specification framework. It's very important to understand that it tells you how to um, authenticate the user and how to authorize a client to obtain uh, different um, uh, resources from the backend uh, and um, to only give access to the resources based on, of course, uh, who uh, who is able to get them, but it's not an implement implementation. So you find different implementations of Wauth2 with different frameworks on different platforms. So you have like Spring Security, for example, is the main way we use uh, to implement um, uh, an Wauth2 system with uh, Spring applications. But you also have a possibility to implement that in .NET. You have the possibility to implement that with PHP, uh, Python, and so on and so forth. So uh, OAuth2 is a specification and not an implementation. That's the first thing we, um, we have to take into consideration. And of course, because I'm a Java developer and I'm a Spring guy main, mainly, uh, in this um, uh, presentation, I will demonstrate you using a Spring application. Mainly, it's again, as I said previously, uh, an authorization server implemented with the new uh, server, uh, new, new authorization server project um, that's uh, in progress to be implemented by the Spring security team, uh, which is a very hot topic, actually. So, um, what it helps us is simply and correctly separate the authentication and authorization responsibilities. And I will start with an analogy because it's very simple to visualize how OAuth 2 work if, if you just think of um, a simple office building where you have to uh, enter as a visitor. Um, in order to get access to different doors, you first go and check in at a specific reception uh, and you present, say, your ID. Just suppose you have to present your ID, that's authentication. So you uh, identify yourself. And after you are uh, identified, you get uh, an access card and, and then you can use the access card to open some of the doors. So it gives you some privileges. Uh, that's the easiest way to think about OAuth 2. And if you think about the reception, that's basically the authorization server. And the building itself is what we call in terms of OAuth 2 a resource server. So I will try to bring my, my microphone uh, closer so you can hear me better, I hope. Uh, and again, so I, I was saying when, when you think about the office build uh, about the office building, the office building is the resource server, which is the back end. It has some doors. You can only open them if you have the proper access key. But to get the access key, you got you go have to go to the reception and you uh, get uh, an access card, which is what we will name in the terminology in the OAuth 2 terminology uh, a token. Uh, okay, sorry for that. Now it's or to um, okay, so um, um, if we um, want to go further, let's let's basically discuss what uh, uh, which, which are the actors in uh, uh, in this uh, in this architecture. You need to know who is communicated communicating with whom in order to understand what happens here. So. Uh, we have the user, of course. Sometimes we have a user. The user is not mandatory. You will see that depending on how and what we implement, uh, we uh, have or not a user. We have a client as well. The client is important. It is uh, in our case the entity uh, that needs access to some specific resources. Uh, you can, to simplify the example, just think about some endpoints exposed by a backend application. Uh, the backend application itself is the resource server in the OAuth2 terminology, we call it a resource server, but because uh, I, I've seen people getting confused about the resource server itself, I just said they're also known as your backend, because when you, you think about the front and backend application, then it's easier to know that the backend protecting the resources is basically what we name in the OAuth2 terminology, 
uh, the resource server. Uh, and no, my user is basically not Darth Vader, but it could be as well. So I, I, I agree that it actually looks like <laughs> Darth Vader. Um, uh, the authorization server, uh, however, is the responsibility that authenticates the user and provides back to the client that access card. So it gets uh, uh, the client gets the access card, which is the token, and it uses the token, the access card, to get resources from the resource server. It's pretty pretty simple. Um, and before going further, I would like to mention that the authorization and the resource server are the responsibilities. What does that mean? It's not necessarily to be different applications, even though it's recommended they are. And in most cases, it's actually beneficial. They are different applications. Uh, but as an idea, in terms of all two specification, it's not uh, defined that they should be different applications or uh, basically implemented in the same application. Um, so we discuss responsibilities. Um, and let me go further. So the two important sides of the problem, I, I was starting the uh, presentation by telling you that we have the two important sides of the problem. One of them being, how does the client here get the token? And of course, the second one being, how does the resource server authorize the token? What, which are the possibilities you can implement? And I will show you now in the presentation, the main important possibilities, uh, but then we will focus on the most encountered one in real world scenarios because of course we can discuss a lot of things about how this can be implemented and apps can be implemented there's probably an infinity of ways you can implement applications and different uh, architectures but uh, uh, it's uh, very relevant uh, to start by discussing uh, which is the most uh, uh, used approach uh, in um, production ready applications so these are the two sides of the problem getting the token number one how do we get the token how do we implement uh, the functionality such that the client can obtain a token what does that imply and secondly is validating the token so how does the resource server know that the token is valid because as you can see on this diagram i didn't put any arrow between the resource uh, the server and the authorization server so uh, is there a way in which the resource server might know uh, if a token is valid or not uh, without communicating somehow to the authorization server? The answer is it really depends on what, on basically how you implement your system. And I'm going to show you three important ways in which you uh, implement the token validations, depending on, of course, how you're implementing the number one point here, getting the token. So token implementations, because in uh, before starting with how to get a token, we need to know which are our possibilities in terms of using tokens. I will first start with what a token is, and then I will go to obtaining a token and then validating the token. And a token, again, a token is basically an access card. There's nothing uh, more to say uh, for you to just understand that it's basically just like the access card you get from the office to, from the office building reception to open some doors. Uh, but what's important to know is that in terms of OAuth, we have two different kinds of tokens that we call opaque and non-opaque token. Opaque it means you can't see through it anything, isn't it? So opaque token is basically a token that doesn't provide you any information inside. While a non-opaque token, where I put uh, between the parentheses here, uh, JWT, the JSON Web Token implementation, is an implementation for a non-opaque token. And is, uh, I could say, the only implementation I have actually have seen in uh, real world scenarios. So I, I just put it, it under, uh, on, in between parentheses there is just because that is mainly what people think, developers think of when they um, um, refer to non-opaque tokens. So non-opaque tokens is more or less equal to JWT. Uh, opaque token can be any string, can be a key, can be a UUID. It's just an information that doesn't provide you anything inside. So the difference between opaque and non-opaque is that when you have an opaque token, you can't use it to itself get information from it. While when you use a non-opaque token, it's a lot of information inside there. And I will show you in this presentation, how does that look like in case of a JWT? It's actually in my next slide, you can see that a JWT token is, um, it's called JWT because it's JSON web token, JSON because you use JSON 
formatting uh, for uh, the information. Uh, as you can see here, say header, and here is what we call the algorithm used for the for signing token body which can contain usually it contains different information you'd like to find out from the user for the client like username roles authorities timestamps expiration date etc and you have a, a hash generated based on a cryptographic algorithm on based on header and the body so that if someone changes the header and the body the signature doesn't um, uh, apply anymore and then the uh, in case of a jwt token as you will see this is the way uh, a resource server validates that indeed the, the token is a valid one uh, now it doesn't look like this when when you look at the jwt token and we will see one when we start our demonstration uh, you will see that the token is basically base64 encoded and each part the header the body and the signature they are separated by a dot so it will be this part small separate by a dot dot this part and then a dot and then the third part which is the signature and this is uh, the token and the token is usually sent uh, no matter if it's an opaque or non-opaque token uh, it's sent through the authorization header of the request uh, it's also prefixed with the word bearer the word bearer meaning if you have this token you get access uh, to the resource so this is uh, important to remember about the, about the tokens to further understand the presentation i will continue with how to get an access token so again going back the main sides of the problem getting a token validating a token maybe you would think that this is only one way in which you can get a token from here but basically a wow to implements different ways in which a client obtains an access token and we call these ways for obtaining the access token in all two terminology grant types so how is the token granted to a specific client and we have several grant types out of the most important usually implemented in applications are the ones that i have um, uh, added to my slide here implicit which from the very beginning, I would like to tell you that it's deprecated. Preferably, you shouldn't uh, encounter it anymore. Uh, and applications that use the implicit grant type should not use it anymore and should um, um, replace it with the authorization code grant type. The authorization code grant type, which is probably the most used, at least when it comes to user authentication, the authorization code grant type uh, which uh, is also uh, possible to enhance uh, with a specific validation key we call Pixie, uh, is uh, today the most used um, grant type when it comes to a client, usually a front-end or a mobile application, obtaining a token from the uh, authorization server in order to further get access to specific resources. Uh, this is basically, again, to say it uh, once one more time, what you would use to replace the implicit grant type, which is deprecated. Uh, it has specific vulnerabilities I won't describe in this presentation, uh, but of course we can uh, talk at the end of the presentation if you'd like more about them. But the idea is that um, uh, you really shouldn't use the implicit grant type anymore. The password grant type uh, is a discussion uh, about making it deprecated. Uh, I think the last specification even made it deprecated, but the password grant type uh, is still used uh, now and then, I, and I, I still um, see it now and then in different um, applications, but it is to avoid, because in the case of the password grant type, the credentials go through the client, and usually only is desirable that only the authorization server knows the user credentials once they are um, obtained by the client that means that the client might be hacked easier uh, or maybe simply you won't have the possibility to do that at all if the client and the server uh, are not part of the same organization because for example implementing a login with github is about two in the end but would do you think would uh, github actually allow you use the password grant type no because that would mean users would be able to uh, somehow implement uh, clients would be able to somehow get the the, the credentials um, from your github account so that's something you definitely won't like so that's why in public at least authorization servers such, such as login with github login with facebook google and so on you will never see this happening so the password grant type is not something that you will see 
uh, unless uh, you have the client and the authorization server as par part of the same organization. And it's still uh, something that's not desirable to use. Uh, so why do you say, I will take the first question, why, why do you say uh, the password grant type should be avoided? What would you use for a web app that has a login? I would use the authorization code grant type. So for a web app and for a mobile app that has a login uh, where the authorization server can be Keycloak or can be uh, Google, can be anything uh, that implements properly an authorization server based on the auth specification, I would still prefer to use the authorization code run type, which does one more redirect, uh, but it's safer from the point of view of the fact that the credentials are only known by the authorization server. So the client never gets, uh, it, uh, never basically uh, gets to see the user's credentials, which is very important. And take my advice, if you are thinking to implement this now, uh, you might also would like to first uh, take a look on the Pixie uh, because implementing it with Pixie, it's also uh, safer. So log into Keycloak with username, password and redirect with authorization code. Exactly. That was my point. Uh, how do I invalidate the token? The token is basically the uh, token invalidation is part of the uh, authorization server uh, and it's uh, specified by, by the OAuth 2 specification. So the authorization server has a revoke endpoint by specification that you can use to revoke a specific, uh, a specific token. Uh, I invite you to take a look at the specification and at the new authorization server. And about the revoke token, uh, I won't go into details with it because it's a short time now, uh, but you can already find uh, a video where I present the revoke token of the new authorization server from Spring Security on my uh, YouTube channel. It's a playlist where you find the new authorization server version 003 of that authorization server implements token revocation. And that video will definitely clarify you more, not only about how to revoke a token, but to actually see it implemented. The client credentials. This is a nice uh, uh, grant type uh, whose role is to allow a client uh, obtain a token without needing a user. Because there are cases where a client needs to call something that is not owned by a user. So say you have a monitoring tool and the monitoring tool is a client for your resource server trying to call uh, at a specific time a health uh, or readiness or, or liveness probe endpoint to check if uh, the um, uh, application is alive or not. That readiness endpoint is not owned by a user. It's simply an endpoint that tells someone if the application is up and running or not. Being that is not owned by a user, then uh, of course having uh, uh, to needing to call it by a client, you still need to obtain a token. But how, but how do you obtain the token in that case if you don't have a user? Well, the client credentials grant type is the way to obtain a token for those cases where you don't need a user approval or authentication. And the last one, the refresh token, which is very often used uh, with the authorization code, um, especially with the authorization code grant type, uh, to uh, renew a token once you, the user already authenticated. Why it is needed is because a token, and I didn't say, say it already, but I, I had to say is uh, that the, the token is uh, ha has a short, lifetime. It, it should have a short lifetime. How short? I don't know. Usually it's 30 minutes. Is the, the specification doesn't tell you how short it should be. It really depends on the system, but it should be short enough. And it definitely shouldn't have a forever lifetime. Uh, the refresh token allows you to get a new access token without needing the user to re-authenticate. In some cases, you want the user to re-authenticate, but in some other cases, you want the user to not be affected by the fact that the client needs to get one more token since, say, the session of the, the specific user didn't end. Uh, and the refresh token allows us to do that. Um, some IDPs have a user behind the credentials gun type. They have service accounts. Um, we, I won't go into details on how these kinds of architecture are implemented. I will, I will now refer only to the specification. A user is not needed, but somehow 
some systems use this user as a workaround, but remember that because I don't, I don't want to, you to confuse it with the client credentials. The client itself has also a user and a password. So I know what you mean. I have seen that sometimes it's also that the client itself is seeing the system as a user, but mind that, that not, that's not part of the all to specification. That's only a customization uh, above the all to specification. In the all to specification, the only important thing is that the client has its own credentials and those are the only credentials needed to get an access token if you are using the client credentials grant type. Um, and because uh, the most important grant type uh, is uh, the authorization code grant type, I, I would like to uh, show it to you on a diagram and see if I implement a client and the client uses the authorization code grant type, how would that work? So which are the steps? And I just, you can see my sequence diagram here should be uh, very easy to understand. I will take it step by step to make sure that you understand it. So I have the user, I as a user want to access some details through a client. The client can be a mobile application or a web page. I want to see something that's mine. And the client can't simply just take that something from the backend, which is the resource server, because uh, if the user didn't authenticate previously, then the client won't be authorized to get those resources. So what the client does is redirecting the user, telling them you have to first log in to the authorization server. So if you are in an application, you can just see how the browser redirects to the authorization server. The authorization server mandatory has to offer a page where the user can authenticate, they can log in there. And basically after they are redirected and uh, uh, they authenticate, with say the right credentials, what happens is that the authorization server provides back to the client a code that we call the authorization code. Hence, this is where it, the name of the, the grant type comes from. The authorization code grant type is because first of all, an authorization code will be granted to the client. And then the client uses this authorization code to get an access token and the token then to obtain uh, the resources from the resource server, AKA calling an endpoint to get some data or change some data or whatever that is. Uh, most people get confused. <clears throat> uh, I found some resources naming one of the actors as resource. resource owner is the user. The user is the resource owner because it owns resources in the resource server. So yes, indeed the resource owner is also part of the terminology sometime in a while too. So no, it's no difference. The user is basically the resource owner. Thank you, Catalin. Um, and uh, what other thing uh, creates confusion here in my experience with the, my students uh, is why, why is this authorization code actually needed? I mean, why didn't the authorization server after uh, uh, this um, um, authentication directly send the access, the access token to uh, the client so that we could save this one more step. And the answer is basically, this is what happened in case of the implicit grant type. Here it is. So in case of the implicit grant type, this is basically what happened. Uh, the authorization server was directly returning to the client, uh, the access token, but this is uh, somehow uh, part of a vulnerability because what happens is that you can trick the authorization server here to instead of calling you through the through a malicious redirect URI, let's call it like this, you provide to it a malicious redirect URI, and instead of redirecting the access token to the right client that initiated the um, uh, process, it will redirect the access token to you, and then that's the way you could actually get access into the system. So it's a very big vulnerability. So that's why you shouldn't ever use the implicit grant type. The authorization code grant type somehow solves this because when uh, this happens, then of course you'd say that's not the same thing. I mean, now you just get the authorization code and you use it, but that's not that easy because the client has also its own credentials. Remember we discussed here, the client itself needs to authenticate as well. So even if I, in that case, like in the case of the implicit grant type, go in between the client 
in the authorization server and somehow get the redirect with the authorization code. Unfortunately, I don't have the client credentials to make the call and get the access token. So that's a little bit better, at least than the implicit gun type. There is still one way to hack into the authorization code. And that's the one solvable with the Pixie site. I won't again go into details now about it, but you, but you can find a video about Pixie uh, in uh, one of the playlists on my YouTube channel. Uh, and yeah, basically that, that, that's, uh, that's it. And this is yeah, in 90% case of, uh, in 90% of the cases, you will find the authorization code gun type. Uh, in most uh, of the cases with authorization code, you also find the refresh token. And then definitely when you don't need the user authentication, then you need uh, a client uh, credentials uh, in that case. So that's, uh, that's basically how it works. Again, if you have questions, if I, I wasn't clear, please let me know and I will go once more uh, over the process, but I will now anyway, go and show you practically some things. So uh, this, this is just the beginning. Uh, once I, I show you, and or maybe maybe this is the, the, the good the time now to show you actually how, how this works on a practical scenario. Um, yeah, let, let, let me go here. I hope you now see my IntelliJ. And I prepared here a very, very simple, straightforward authorization server implementation with Spring Security, which uses what we call the new authorization server. Who is the client in this example? The browser, a Node.js server, a reverse proxy, a full API gateway. So it can be anyone who needs to call a resource. It can be any of those you enumerated. Uh, in my case, I just used a client, which you can imagine it's a web application, but the OAuth2 specification doesn't tell you what the uh, what the client is. It can even be a different service that is an outside service of a system and that needs to somehow get uh, access to some, end, uh, some endpoints exposed by a resource server here. So can OAuth2 stop after code receiving? Yes, if, if nobody uses the code, then nothing will happen. The, the access token won't, won't be used. So if, if uh, at the very end, you want to get a token, the access token, if you only get the code and you don't use it, that's it. Uh, but the idea is, the full idea is that what you want in, in the end is to get an access token because that's the key to get access to resources on the resource server. So this, this, is, this is what you need here. This is the access card from our analogy at the beginning of the presentation. You get an access card from the, off, from the reception and you, you open doors with it. So this, this is basically the access card you want to get. And you have to go all this flow to get the access card if you are using the authorization code grant type. The token can be a JVT token, yes. The JVT token is one implementation and maybe the, the most used implementation of a token. But yes, the question, the answer is a JVT token can be the token you get here, depending on how you implement your application. In my case, actually here, now I, I'm really going to my uh, IntelliJ and I hope you can see my screen. Uh, I'm, I'm really going to show you here an example where yes, I use a JVT token as an implementation. And I will very, very fast drive you through the code. Don't exp I won't explain it all because it requires a lot of um, uh, knowledge from Spring Security. Uh, and I, it's not the purpose of the presentation, uh, but I will explain you the important things you need to know. The important things is that I'm using a user. I'm, I have only one user, username, user one, and the password. Usually, of course, users will come from a database or they will come from a specific other system. But in my case, it's a simple application. And in my case, I only added an in-memory user I'm, I'm going to use for our demonstration of the authorization code grant type. Then we need a client. The client has itself, let's call it a username and a password. They are not really called username and password. They are called to be distinguished from the user. They are called client ID and client secret. But they are basically just a set of credentials. I, I here have them as client and secret. So this is basically the set of credentials you would need first. The, the client itself needs to authenticate with whenever 
uh, it uh, uh, requires uh, any kind of action with the authorization server. Uh, and this is basically also what's needed uh, if the client wants to get a token via the client credentials grant type. Uh, it's possible you don't need them. You, it's possible to avoid uh, authentication completely, but you usually use basic authentication. So it's, uh, uh, it's not something that I would ever recommend you um, take out the, the basic authentication from uh, the endpoints provided by the authorization server. You can see here that I, I configured my client so that I can use the authorization code grant type because that's what I want to uh, demonstrate to you. Uh, and if you could talk at the, at the end of the live about sessions in general, yes, I, I will, I will. If, if I don't remember, remind me please and I will. Uh, and then we have the redirect URI. Maybe, maybe you were wondering in my diagram, how does the server know that it needs to redirect to a specific URI? Nobody asked me. How does the, the, the server know that the, the client is at a specific, and it needs to be redirected to a specific URI in the browser? And the actually the answer is because you register it in the authorization server. And as you will see, depending on how you use it, you also have to send it sometimes. Um, now I'm going to show you a scopes. Scopes is basically um, a domain you'd like to make available for a specific client, but I don't, don't want to get you confused uh, about that. So it's just imagine it as just a, some kind of uh, role or authority, but on the client side for the moment. But what you can see here is an OIDC, and maybe some of you already know that this is basically coming from OpenID Connect. And the OpenID Connect, because this is also a confusion I, I see often, is that OpenID Connect, Connect is not something different from all of two. OpenID Connect is only a protocol that is designed uh, as a specification over the OAuth 2 specification. So it has some more restrictions because what happens is that you will see if you are using OAuth 2, you have, uh, you're very free to do some things like for example, using some any, any kind of a scope as I demonstrate here, I use the scopes read and write. Uh, and I could use any kind of string as a scope, but the OpenID, one of the things it does, the OpenID specification is that it restricts to specific scopes. Another thing is that it changes a bit the answer and it provides one more token, which is called the ID token. But being that I'm not discussing that open ID connect, uh, I'm just wanting to make sure that you know that the difference is not that big between OAuth 2 and open ID connect. Um, and the other uh, below, I'm not going even to show you because these are only generating some keys. So I signed the token with them. I will directly go to uh, starting this spring up authorization server. And now let's try to use it. So let's try to basically use it. I, I don't have a client. If, if I would have uh, needed to implement a client as well, it took too much time. So uh, I don't have that time now. So we, we will be the client. Imagine you are the client. What should you do now is basically you need somehow to get the client to redirect the user somehow to the authorization server, telling the user that they need to authenticate. Let's do that. So I'm going to use now the URLs as per the uh, OAuth 2 specification. And you see localhost 8080 is my port. I started on 8080, which is the default port in a Spring Boot application, OAuth 2 authorize. And then I say response type code, which means uh, I, would like an act, uh, I, I would like an authorization code. I'm going to use the authorization code gun type. Please give me authorization code. The client ID, which is client, scope, and something is missing from here, the redirect URI, uh, which is by the means of uh, the OAuth 2 specification, not mandatory. So you, you don't mandatory need to provide the redirect URI from the client side. Uh, but uh, if I'm using OpenID Connect, then it becomes mandatory by the specification of OpenID Connect. So I'm going now to enter it and you see how instantaneously I have been redirected to a login form, which is the default login form. And then I'm going to say user one and password here. And if I correctly authenticated, something happened and I didn't correctly authenticate, of course, um, 
uh, because you see this error. Let me try again, password maybe. Okay, I will try to restart it because I have a session here and, and most probably is because of that. But the idea is that I will be redirected to this local host 8080 and I will be given the authorization code. So let me try it again. OAuth2, uh, client ID client, open ID connect, redirect URI. Oh, sorry, no, it was actually my fault, not my application, it's local host. Okay, local host. So this should be fine now. I'm going back, user one, password. And finally, don't worry, it's a white label error page because I didn't implement this page. But what you can see is that I have been properly redirected with a code in case I would have wanted to continue the implementation of my client, then I would have needed to implement this page, of course, and make use of the code. But what you see I've been provided here with, this is what is called the authorization code. So this is basically what I'm now able to use to obtain an access token. So to obtain an access token, I can go to a postman and call the HTTP localhost 8080 wow 2 token endpoint and with the post, okay, perfect. And what do I need here? I need to specify the grant type. So I say, I use authorization code. And then I need to say I'm the client, client one. Oh no, it's simply client, I think, sorry. So it's just client, yes. And I need to say, I want the scope Open ID, which should match to the scope I requested. And then I need to say the redirect URI is, and this, this necessarily needs to be in case of Open ID Connect, the exact URI on the server side. Authorized, HTTP localhost 8080, authorized. Let's check it again, 8080 authorized, okay. And, and something is missing from here. And that is, that is basically the code that I copied to obtain the token. And I still have to do something because we use basic authentication. The client and the secret are my credentials. Remember, we use basic authentication. So that means we need to specify the proper credentials here in this case. And I'm sending the response and you see that uh, something happened and it worked okay. We have a 200 okay. And these are, this is basically the access token I got. This is exactly what you get by the end of this step here. So this is the step we, we, uh, we, we got the token, we, we got the authorization code, we sent the authorization code, we got the access token, and now theoretically we can use the access token. So now, that I'm, I took the access token. You see an ID token. This is not by the OAuth2 specification. This ID token is because I'm using Open ID Connect, is specifically to Open ID Connect, and it's meant only to get details about the user here. But the access token, this is a JWT, and now what I would like to do together with you is analyze it a bit. I will go to JWT IO page, which is a nice place where you can just paste the encoded token and you will see decoded, not this token, the JWT. Uh, sorry for that. Try it again. And I'm going, where was it here? Okay, and now what you see, it, there are the three parts that you have here, the header, the body, and the signature separated by dots. And then you see the decoded one on the header. So this basically is just a base 64 encoding of what you see here, which is the token, the, the information in the header of the token. Then we have the body here. And then you have here user, client, and different details in the body. And then you have the signature that is used to 
validate. It's used by the resource server to validate that the token is uh, valid. Shouldn't you use OAuth to, to authenticate to a server used for OAuth 2? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question, sorry. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm using OAuth 2. I, I don't do anything special here. I just use OAuth 2 to do that. If, if it was another question, just let me know. Um, so uh, um, then I'm, I'm now going to show you something else. And that's, okay, we got a token. You just see me getting a token. How do we validate the token? The most straightforward approach to validate the token is called introspection. And introspection is when the resource server gets the token. So we have, again, the client obtained somehow a token. And the token was sent to the resource server. How does the resource server know that the token is valid? Calls an endpoint on the authorization server. The authorization server exposes an endpoint. The resource server calls the endpoint, sees if the token is valid or not. This is called introspection, rarely used, and only used usually with opaque tokens. So those tokens where you don't have any information inside them. If it's a non-opaque token like my JWT here, you don't need a direct link between the resource server and the authorization server, which architecturally speaking, creates some problem which you don't want in your system. Yes, uh, Yon, I'm, I'm using the, the new O2 server here. I'm, I, I've been uh, creating the example with the new server. Um, then another approach, I, I skipped another approach, is called blackboarding, but I, I skipped it for a reason uh, in my presentation because it's something uh, I, don't, uh, um, I don't recommend at all. So let's, let's keep it if I didn't put it. But what we will be using here is crypto signatures. So you've seen me obtaining this token, which is signed. This third part here of the token is the signature. If something changes here, the signature doesn't apply anymore. So that's, that's why the signature is very, very important, is the way the resource server knows this token is indeed valid. What happens is that when the authorization server issues the token, it uses a private key to sign the token. So only the authorization server knows that private key. When the resource server gets the token, it has the public key, which is a pair to that private key and can be used only to validate if a token is, if a, a specific signature is valid, if, if the token in this case has been indeed signed with the private part of that key. That's what we do when we use actually asymmetric uh, key pairs, which is in most of the cases what we do. So we get a token, we give the token from the client to the resource server. The resource server uses the public key and validates that indeed the token hasn't been altered meanwhile and was indeed signed with the private key of that specific authorization server, which of course means that prior, you have to configure somehow the keys into the system. So uh, I'm a little bit confused with the terminology. Isn't that, isn't it that browser will get authorization code and it will pass the code to the client and then the app will call the authorization server client ID and secret. Uh, Uh, I'm not sure. Let's let's take that 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 at the end because I I'm not sure how to to reply. I'm not sure if I understood the question. Is this an RSA algorithm? It might be yes. Uh, and then the client to the authorization server can be identified that needs resources from the resource server. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, go back here. So again, this is what we do when you, we use uh, cryptographic signatures. You. Uh, it's, again, there are different ways in which you can, um, you can configure the keys. Uh, one of the most used is actually having uh, the authorization server exposing the public keys, but it can also be statically configured. So you can have uh, the authorization and the resource server configured manually its own key pair, uh, which usually is uh, problematic when you do key rotations, that means exchanging the keys. Uh, which should happen in a secure system once in a while, but is a, is a possible way to do that. 
Um, and now I will hands on implementing was already. Uh, I will now uh, present you some learning resources and then I will take uh, again all the questions that I missed. Uh, you might want to rewrite if I missed one of yours uh, in uh, in the chat, uh, and then we will go straight forward to the uh, quiz, the Kahoot quiz, uh, and see who will be the winners. So um, OAuth two in general and OpenID Connect they are very complex uh, topics, uh, and it's basically not something that you can talk in detail about in one hour, definitely. So you need to study a lot more if you are interested to learn in detail what they, how, how they work. And um, I would recommend you in terms of the OAuth2 specification framework, the OAuth2 in uh, action by Antonio Sanso. Uh, and this new book basically that's in early access program, OpenID Connect in action is describing you what OpenID comes with on top of OAuth2. And then if you are really interested in how to implement OAuth 2 Spring Security, then you can uh, have a look on my book, Spring Security in Action. Uh, and I have uh, a lot of videos uh, on my YouTube uh, channel about them. You can check them as well and subscribe if you like them. And I just started a blog, so I will probably blog, uh, um, I will write, write articles on my blog about that as well. Uh, the idea is I hope I at least clarify some things and. Uh, uh, given you some taste of um, uh, OAuth 2.0 and some appetite to learn a little bit more about more about it, uh, Kahoot. But before Kahoot, let me take once more some questions. So, do we get the slides? Yes, you will get the slides. Uh, if you want, you can get the code as well uh, because I already have it on my GitHub account. Uh, the redirection will send the code to the backend app, and the backend app will get the token to give it back to the client via the session. Yes, I think uh, Rodislav, this is uh, this is precisely uh, how it happens. So, if that was the question from uh, Musa or Musha, sorry for um, uh, not pronouncing correctly your name, then then indeed this is the explanation. Uh, and more in detail, detail because I know again one hour is is not enough. Uh, check out my YouTube channel because you'll find you'll find more videos and leave me comments uh, and questions there as well as well as on Twitter and uh, and LinkedIn and I will uh, I will try to answer you. Um, then normally the user's credentials and the client credentials should be encrypted and stored in the DB of the authorization server. Yes, normally they should, of course, come from a DB, not, not plugged into the application, but that this was only a way to simply create an app to be able to demonstrate you today. Uh, so what is the de facto standard for OAuth 2, Okta Keycloak? OAuth 2 is, just, is a, a, again, just a specification. You can uh, have different uh, authorization servers to implement in different platforms. Okta, Keycloak uh, are third parties to implement your authorization server. Uh, the Spring Security OAuth project uh, is now deprecated, but you still find it in uh, existing applications. And the Spring Security teams uh, team is now uh, working on implementing uh, this nice new authorization server. Uh, I'm also part of uh, the people who collaborate uh, and work for this authorization server. I'm, I'm happy to say that, and I will continue to do that. And I, I also invite you, if you'd like to contribute to open source, contribute to this nice project. Uh, but uh, of course, that's um, it, it, I can't say it, it's a way to go. Uh, it really depends. And of course, in terms of the resource server, also depending on uh, your platform, every platform has its own way to, to implement a resource server. Uh, the OAuth2 specification is so important that you can't actually not have a way. What is Kahoot? Very good question. So Kahoot is an application. And what, uh, what I would like you to do now is in the browser, go to Kahoot IT. And you will be asked to enter a game pin that I will give you. My recommendation is you uh, stay on a specific, on, on a different uh, device. You can install also the app on your Android or iOS devices, uh, or you can have a different monitor because uh, when you will log in, 
uh, you will see in my presentation the questions and the answers, and you will have to answer. I have five questions for you, and the top three winners will guarantee um, get uh, guaranteed get a uh, spin security in action book. Uh, and the first uh, three to get the spin security in action book uh, who are from Romania, I will personally deliver them uh, a book uh, on paper like this one with my signature. So why not let's start the Kahoot now and then I can, uh, I can further uh, discuss other questions if you have, and I will stay, uh, stay with you. Uh, whoever wants to join, I think Kahoot only supports a maximum of 100. I see you are a little bit more than 100 here. <laughs> uh, so if you'd like to, if you don't want to, to join, don't do it. But uh, if you'd like, then enter Kahoot it or the application. Uh, and uh, uh, no, nah, not really personally delivered. I, 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 yeah, I, I will actually deliver it by mail. Sorry for the confusion. Uh, and I will just give you now the game pin. So let's see how many people, one thing, one thing, one important thing is please use the name from, uh, from uh, the, the, the same name you have uh, in the uh, community, because if you don't have, if you don't use the same name you have on the community, then I won't be able to identify you, of course. If you don't want to be identified, then it's, it's fine, it's up to you. Uh, you can play, uh, but just mind that in order to get the book, uh, in case uh, uh, you will be the winner, uh, then uh, you need to use uh, the, the name so, so I can uh, I can find you then and send you an email and ask for your address or simply send you an email with um, uh, the uh, the code for the the ebook. Okay, I'm still I'm still waiting a little bit. While I'm waiting, I will answer more questions. I'm happy to see so many questions actually. Uh, the latest spin security version authorization server is deprecated. Yes, indeed. I was just explaining that uh, we are building a new authorization server. It's actually the one I was using here. Uh, and um, of course, again, more clarifications you can also find on my YouTube channel. Uh, I won't personally deliver. Sorry for the misunderstanding. I will uh, I will send them by post <laughs> or by by some delivery guy. But I, I won't knock on your door uh, if you are afraid. If you were afraid of that, of course. <laughs> uh, doesn't Keycloak bring too much boilerplate features for uh, sim simple applications? Uh, or in my opinion, yes. I uh, prefer avoid uh, using third parties uh, in uh, most cases. But of course, the decisions. Uh, are not taken just by if it is or not. I don't know. Uh, it, it, there are a lot of aspects you need to take into consideration when you think about if you should use a third party or not, if it should be Okta or Keycloak, if it, it, it's, it's the, the, an architectural decision and it really, really depends on, on the system uh, for that. Okay. I didn't understand OpenID Connect. So OpenID Connect is a set of restrictions. I will just tell you shortly, maybe I will create later a video on OpenID Connect to be more uh, clear. But OpenID Connect, just imagine you have OAuth 2 and you have some more restrictions, a specification that comes with some more restriction over OAuth 2. And that's basically OpenID Connect. It restricts some of the things that the OAuth 2, where, where the OAuth 2 specification is uh, not enough rigid. Uh, what do I recommend third party tools or from scratch? Again, just discussed it. So it depends in, uh, in some cases, I do prefer use third party tools because they uh, already implement some things that I don't have to implement myself. But sometimes uh, I need to implement uh, something from, from scratch, like not really from scratch, but using a framework like screen security in this case. Uh, how further communication between backend and front end should be implemented? Uh, well, once you have the access token, you just put it in your, in your uh, authorization uh, header on the request, and you basically access the, the resource server. Uh, because I cannot answer you in detail now, I invite you to see the videos I already have on my YouTube channel on that. 
Uh, I actually have a list of 34 or 36 videos uh, on Spring Security and uh, about 10 or more than 10 of them are on implementing uh, authorization and resource servers in detail. So you, you will, if you really want uh, to find out the details, you will get plenty of details from there. The user agent is getting the authorization code and sends it to the backend app. I'm not sure what you mean by the user agent. You mean the browser probably? Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand again precisely the question. But I, I, what I want to say, what I wanted to say when I said probably that that's the question: direct communication between uh, the client and the authorization server is that you input the if you say you you uh, authenticate with Google uh, and you uh, uh, you access I don't know uh, say meetup.com and you authenticate with Google then what happens is that meetup.com doesn't know anything about your credentials because you directly insert them in Google. That's what I wanted to say. I hope that that was the question. I make it clear. Kahoot is, uh, is just a, a game with, uh, with uh, uh, questions. Uh, and we will have at the end the podium and uh, you will find out who wins basically the uh, books. When will be the new authorization server available for production? Not, not something I can say. Uh, I don't expect it personally to be by the end of this year. When not in Google? No, the all two books will be raffled for everyone. So we will uh, we have ebook vouchers. So uh, just uh, put your name in uh, in that form, and uh, if you are out of the winners, uh, you will get an ebook voucher. Any plans to make a video on Keycloak, Okta, or it depends. I will maybe, I, I, I will uh, add it to my list. Okay, 86, 87, let's, let's start. So I give you 10 more seconds to, um, uh, to enter the game if you'd like. If not, I will press the start button. So let me see. One. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, let's start the game. So, you theoretically found out the answers from directly this uh, presentation. I let you now focus and let's see who wins. You have 30 seconds for each question to answer. And the time is also important. The faster you answer, the more points you get. First question. So we have the authorization server sends a code to the client after the user authenticates. Which grant type is it? And the answer was authorization code. And I was saying during the presentation that that's basically why it's called an authorization code. So mind I didn't say a token. It's a difference between the code and the token. In this case, in the authorization code run type, uh, it will, um, uh, the, the authorization server sends a code to the client after the user authenticates. Let's see how the podium is by now. So if you see your name, you're going to be happy about it. Next, four more questions. Uh, as I told you, you don't see the questions. You see, you see them only here. I, I, I said at the beginning, you should use a mobile phone or a, diff, a different uh, screen because you will only see here the, uh, the question and you have to select the answer from your device, but on your device, you only see uh, the answers, not the question. Okay, again, uh, most of you got it right, uh, fill in. In the OAuth 2 specification, the client uses a token to access resources that are protected by the resource server or by 
uh, the, that the resource server protects. So uh, indeed, token was the correct answer here. Again, again, we have a book done on the first place, but we still have three more questions. Let's see, next. So perfect, we have uh, uh, the private key was the correct answer, uh, but there were still many answers who, that were not right. Let's read again the question and uh, see why. When using asymmetric key pairs, which part of the pair does the authorization server use to sign tokens? From the pair, the private key is the one used because the authorization server is the only one able to sign tokens. So. Uh, that, that's a really important action, signing the token, is like making them official. Uh, you can't have somebody else being able to do that because otherwise they would be able to produce tokens and access resources on the resource server side. So that's why it's, named, it's called a private key because it's private and only accessible to that entity able to uh, do this important action of signing the token. Cool. Let's see if uh, something changed. We had some changes, but we are still on the way. Authorization code, the implicit and password run type, they require the user to authenticate in order to get the token. And not sure which question is this. Do we have another one? Let's see. Five of five is the last one. Which are the parts that compose a signed JVT? And we have 70 correct answers. That's very good. A header, a body, and the signature. And that was the last question. So let's let's see what happens. I'll... Do you want me to press the next button and see the podium? Okay, let's see. Okay, Aymer, you got a voucher for an ebook, book done. And number one, George, yes. <laughs> so uh, again, I will I will uh, find you uh, in case uh, in case I don't find you. I would like to let you know that uh, my email address, uh, and you can you can find me on my email address as well. Um, or you find me on LinkedIn, better better on LinkedIn or on um, uh, on YouTube, and let me know uh, if I if I didn't find you. Let me know, and I will uh, uh, promise to to send you a book if you are from um, Romania. If you have, a, have an address in Romania, I will send it to you on paper. Uh, if not, um, I will send you a voucher for uh, an ebook. Uh, and uh, let's see, Victor. Uh, do you want to? Yes. 
All right. So, um, thanks for this, uh, uh, this, this the prizes, but it's my turn now. So I also want to raffle the winners to, let me share my screen first. I just want to put this here, share screen. I will share over you. Uh, there it is. So this is the form uh, for your privacy. I, I've hidden the emails. And we will raffle using random.org. Let's see how many of you are uh, entered here, 110. So random.org. And from random.org, there is the sequence generator, which from two to how many were here? 101, 110. 110. And we will take the first uh, six, if six. I'm not mistaken. So we get sequence. Okay, and go. You say one, two, three four five six these yeah. are the now the persons who won and this is what i did for every time i um i drew these raffles for you so 62 let me just put it there and then here and let's see 62 basically i have your email right now but let me announce the name 62 is too, too small huh 62 is Sorin, Sorin Aburdan. Here we go. So this is one winner. 14, Radvan Bonta. Right. Uh, 48. 48 is no name, but I will look probably just fill the email. Doesn't matter. The email is hidden right here. Here, 89. Valerio Emanuel. Ah, nice. Right. And 108, did I count it correctly? There are six, yes. 108. Uh, Balas Kseli, yeah, someone entered, but it's too late, sorry. And uh, nine. Nine is Daniel Moldovan. So basically, this is it. We will send you the emails afterwards. I will, I will uh, give your emails to, to Lorenzo. Lorenzo, thanks, thanks very much for, for the presentation. It was very interesting. I listened for the whole stuff. Very cool, very nice, clear presentation. Uh, thank you all for being here. Anything else, Lorenzo, do you want to add anything else? Maybe um, share again the screen over me and I'll stop my sharing so we can put your contact details in case they want to reach you. Yeah, just uh, better to share again with them your contact, uh, that first slide that you had. Yeah, just and thank you very much share again, everyone again. Uh, uh, your, uh, your social uh, connection, your so social details. Yeah, the just, first slide just, in the presentation, I think. Just thank you very much, uh, uh, everyone. That's so uh, that's if you want to get in touch uh, with me. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>